The grapevine, when healthy, produces an abundance of grapes that can be used for many purposes. I mean, grapes can be eaten fresh. They can be used for making jams, jellies, grape juice, raisins, vinegar, grapeseed oil, and of course, wine. The grapevine, it can grow on the ground. It can grow on stakes or poles. It can be planted in an orchard. It even can be trained to climb trees. But this sweet fruit, it grows in clusters. And you can even use the grape leaves in recipes such as one of my favorite Middle Eastern recipes, grape leaves. Grapes, they have been cultivated for thousands of years and have been used by many civilizations dating back to ancient times. As you can see, when you have healthy vines, it produces good fruit. And as you can see by this orchard, there is a lot of fruit being produced. Did you know that the grapevines are mentioned more than any other plant in the entire Bible? The grapevine was, was very important culturally and economically in biblical times. Because of its centrality in everyday life, it is often used symbolically in scripture. A fruitful vine, which is a symbol of obedient Israel, while wild grass or an empty vine spoke of Israel's disobedience. So first, let us define who Israel is. To many, Israel is a country, and it is. But biblically speaking, Israel is God's people. What made Israel unique is that God was using them to further his plan of redemption for the human race. This plan, it started with an individual, with Abraham. And God did not call Abraham because he was stronger or smarter or richer than any other people in the world. What set him apart from other people was how he responded to God. He believed him and he was faithful to obey. And this continued on in history leading up to the time of Jesus. And this concept of God's people, it didn't really change. We, the church, followers of Christ are God's people. And the same mission and the same purpose that God intended then is still active today. His plan? His plan is to draw all peoples in the world to himself. And you're probably wondering, how is this done? Well, it happens by us, his people reflecting his character, by his people serving the world around them, by his people giving sacrificially, by his people loving others as they love themselves, by obeying all of his commands. See, that is the biggest issue here. Many of us, we're not producing good fruit because we aren't willing to obey. I mean, have you ever thought about what an obedient follower of Jesus really looks like? Well, let me ask you this. Do you even know what the commands of Christ are? I mean, did you know that there are 1,050 commands in the New Testament? Overwhelmed? Yeah, I am too. But truly, we can boil them down to 49 commands of Christ. Some of those, just to name a few, repent, follow him, rejoice, honor his law, be reconciled, do not lust, keep your word. I mean, those are just a few. But what we need to understand is this. First, we must understand what Jesus is calling us to and then be willing to actively obey his commands. I mean, what did Jesus say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? I mean, it was Jesus who said, if you love me, you will do what I say. My friends, this is so serious. I mean, Jesus is saying that without obedience, we lack true love for him. So let me ask you, do you love Jesus? Well, if you do, obey him. I mean, it is absolutely required in this life as a follower of his. Just as those fruitful grapevines represent an obedient people called Israel in the Old Testament, that expectation hasn't changed. Today, we, the body of Christ, is called to be fruitful. And that begins with obedience to his ways. My friends, he's calling us. Church, stand up. Stand up today and actively follow this King of Kings. He alone is worthy.